Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Igor. And thanks for coming early in the morning. I guess it's early for some. It's definitely early for me since I arrived around 3.30 a.m. in the morning <laughs> today. And uh, as Igor said, uh, I think we have until 3 or so in the afternoon. So feel free to ask questions uh, during the talk. Because if you don't ask, I will keep covering a lot of material. And I have a lot of it. <laughs> I promise I can talk about this for days and days and days and days and days and it will never end because it's such an important topic. Okay, as you see over here I'm going to talk about memory uh, and I've divided this into six parts. It's really a six part uh, series of lectures, uh, heterogeneous, they're not all the same in terms of length. We'll, start, we'll first start with the importance of memory and the trends that we have related to memory. So this is going to be a very broad overview. But before I start, let me give you very quickly, I'm at ETH, as Igor mentioned. Uh, I also, I used to be at CMU, I still have some PhD students at CMU. I got my PhD from UT Austin, and I worked at many different places. I started the uh, a computer architecture group at Microsoft Research. I uh, worked a lot at Intel before that and AMD during my PhD. I did a lot of internships, and I worked at Google and VMware, and I consult with com uh, companies also. If you want to reach me, that's my email address. You can find online also if you search for my name, it's easy and uh, you can find more information. I do research and teaching in computer architecture, computer systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics. You'll see examples of this a lot uh, during this lecture. By the way, can people in the back hear me? Yeah. Is it okay? Okay, good. And you can see the last line of the slides at the bottom. Hard. It's a bit hard, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, you, can, you can come closer if you want. There's space, there's space over here, but it's up to you. Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll talk a lot about these issues. I think this is all very exciting today, in my opinion. It's, it's a good time to be doing research across the hardware-software interface, as we will see in these lectures, hopefully. These are some of the topics that we work on. Again, very broadly, uh, we're going to talk a lot about memory and storage today. I'm going to focus on memory in general, but we're going to look at DM in particular. But a lot of the ideas that I'm going to talk about are applicable to other technologies also. And I'm going to give you examples. How many people here are computer architecture students, PhD students? Okay. What about other areas? Operating systems? Software? Okay, I see, I see people nodding. So at least you're close. Compilers? Okay, there's one person. That's great. Compilers. We need more people doing compilers these days, I think. That's, that's something that's not happening, unfortunately. But Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about memory and storage. Uh, I'm going to give you examples of the really interesting interaction between hardware security, energy efficiency, fault tolerance, and performance today. We're going to see all of those are becoming difficult going into the future. We're going to talk about system architecture interaction, new execution models, new interfaces that are needed for those like computation close to data. We're going to talk a lot about that. How do you do processing inside the memory, for example. Heterogeneous and parallel systems, GPUs and systems for data analytics. We're going to talk a lot about, about that also. But I'm going to start with something that's very close to my heart in a sense. This, uh, on bioinformatics. We do a lot of work on bioinformatics right now also and g genome sequence analysis and assembly. Both algorithms and architectures are very interesting uh, for me. And I'm going to give you an example of this to motivate the problem that we have with memory. You may not understand all of this, that's okay. Uh, if you're interested, this is also a very great area to do research in. How do you actually do ex uh, accelerate genome analysis? Uh, there's a, there are a lot of research topics in it and I'm going to give you references. All of these slides will be available uh, later on. If you email me, I can send them to you also. Uh, but the goal is to really motivate the big memory problem that we have. Okay, these are some directions that we're going to cover. Sec fundamentally secure, reliable, safe architectures, energy efficient architectures, low latency, and architectures for genomics, medicine, and health. Let's start with the last one to motivate everything else. So this is, uh, I call this a motivating detour. Uh, so this is something that uh, when I started at Microsoft Research as, uh, as a founding member of the computer architecture group at that time, this was in 2006, uh, I was thinking of what are the big problems going into the future. And we were doing a hike with one of my friends at the University of Washington Genome Sciences Department, whom I collaborated with over the years for a long time. And we were thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have this, basically an embedded device that can perform genome analysis very quickly, in real time, let's say. Let's say within a minute. You ask a question like this. This is one example question that you can ask. Which of these DNAs does this DNA segment match with? Or what is the likely genetic disposition of this patient to this particular drug that I'm really 
uh, keen on administering to this person, but I don't know how they will react, and I want to understand it immediately because then I can uh, go go through the uh, medical iteration loops, right? And I want to, uh, we wanted to have a device that we, that we could give to the doctors that, uh, and they, so that they could do this within a minute. Today, actually, you, can, you cannot answer this question within weeks sometimes, depending on the type of the question. As a result, you don't have this type of very quick iteration in personalized medicine. So, of course, uh, there, are, there, there are many other questions that you can answer if you had this device. So when we were dreaming, we didn't have even small devices that could se sequence genomes. And of course, everybody has genomes. Has anybody studied biology here? Hopefully everyone, or some sort of, in, in high school, no biology? Okay, good. <laughs> At least high school biology, you probably have seen something like this, right? The genome consists of these base pairs, ACTG, and you can read about biology for more. This is real. All of us have it. All living organisms have it, actually. This is an example from Henrietta Lacks' genome. It was taken uh, against her consent, actually. He, he, she didn't know about it, and this enabled a lot of discovery of genomes uh, in real life. So today, actually, this is very difficult to do. It's, it's good to think about so social privacy issues that we have today also, and how it relates to scientific progress. But that's a totally different discussion, of course. Yeah. So let, let's go to the uh, DNA sequencing, focus on this part. So the goal in DNA sequencing is to find the complete sequence of these bases, base pairs in the DNA, ACTGs. And in a human DNA, you have 3.2, more than 3.2 billion base pairs. And you want to find how my DNA looks like, that 3.2 billion sequence. Now the problem is, uh, there is no machine that we could find, uh, devise so far that takes the long DNA as input and that gives the entire sequence as output. All machines are imperfect, meaning they're actually choppers. They chop the DNA into pieces and they identify these relatively small pieces, they tell you what they are, although they have errors, they're not perfect in the identification also. But they definitely don't tell you how these different pieces fit together. So you have this 3.2 billion base pair DNA. The chopper comes in, chops it into 300 base pair segments, very small segments. So you have many of those segments. You have some error rate in each segment. So with, with less than 1% error, uh, you identify the segment. But you don't know how these segments fit together. So the goal is to really reconstruct everything. It's a computational problem, so it's not very easy. I, I uh, liken this to untangling yarn balls. If you have a cat that plays with these yarn balls and it becomes a mess, right? Now, uh, how do you reconstruct an entire uh, string of that's blue, for example? Well, you, one, one way of doing this is you go through and chop it into pieces and then put, put the pieces back together, right? That's essentially what a chopper looks like today. And these are the choppers that we have in gene, gene analysis today. So this was actually, uh, this is one of the fastest ones. It's not the fastest one, but this, this is actually about $3 million today. It gives you uh, pieces of 300 base pairs length, very short, very accurate, more than 99% accuracy in those pieces. Uh, but these are small, so you have a, lot, a computational problem to put these together. So this thing actually is very interesting. This thing, you can, you can see that this fits in your hand. Uh, this didn't exist when we were dreaming. When we were dreaming, we, we were researchers, we believed in the technology, and we believed that people will come up with machines that look like this, maybe five years, ten years down the road. And this happened in 2014, this is called the nanopore sequencing technology. And this is uh, very cheap, a thousand, two thousand dollars or so, and you can actually Take, uh, take it and do your own sequencing if you have the ability to do everything else. Uh, and the, the downside is it chops DNA, actually the upside is it chops DNA into large pieces, like a million base pairs, which is good because you have f smaller number of those fragments in a human genome, for example. The downside is it's a, it has a lot of errors. The error rate and identification of those large pieces is about 10%, 15%. Uh, we may talk about that later on, uh, although we don't have a lot of time today. But this, uh, so th these uh, show kind of the two extremes of different machines. But both of them lead to computational problem. How do you identify those pieces in the end? And clearly, genome analysis is important. People have spent a lot of time to enable it. The Human Genome Project was the first one that really enabled it. And later, now we actually, this is a very famous graph that people use that show that this is the cost of a, a transistor as dictated by Moore's law, and this is the cost of DNA sequencing. So you can see that it's much, uh, the cost is reducing much faster. And this was the development of these high throughput sequencing technologies, and this is the development of the nanopore sequencing technology. So you can see that the cost has jumped down with the technology. And clearly, as a result, people are uh, sequencing a lot of genomes to identify them. For example, the nanopore device, people are using it everywhere in the world to sequence different kind of viruses 
for example, or in animals, whatever you want, sequence, and they're trying to understand uh, uh, different relationships. Uh, uh, because it's so cheap, they can do it. The downside is the analysis is the bottleneck now. Basically, we can sequence so many genomes that we are not able to analyze them. We are not able to ask all of the questions we want to them because the computational bottleneck is huge. In fact, when they sequence, the, uh, for example, a, a virus genome in Africa, what they do is, because they don't have the processing capability to do the processing they want in the device, uh, and they don't have the processing capability in their laptops, they actually send all of that data to a data center and it gets processed in the data center. We're, so we're causing a lot of data movement in the system because I, I believe we're not designing our systems in the right ways. Okay, so this is going to be an example that we're going to uh, talk about. So basically the takeaway is we know how to do this really well. We can sequence genomes really, really at high throughput at low cost. But we don't know how to reconstruct them really well so that we can ask questions later to it, say, asking, okay, is this a gene that, I, that is interesting to me? Or is this person vulnerable to this particular uh, disease? Or uh, can they interact well with this drug? And then we're basically are bottlenecked in the scientific discovery because we're uh, computationally bottlenecked. And also we're bottlenecked by medicine clearly, right? Okay, so these are some other example questions that I'm not going to talk about in detail, but basically uh, this is called multiple sequence alignment. You're trying to really figure out how these many different sequences from potentially many different species are similar or different, so that maybe you can, you can categorize them uh, in terms of how they relate to each other. That's one example, right? There are many applications to this. This is another example. I like this picture because it's drawn nicely, as you can see. <laughs> You're not supposed to <laughs> think even deeper, but you can read the papers that are related. Uh, there, there are very, very interesting studies that show that if you can accurately identify pieces of a genome with some error allowed, then you can actually do a lot of interesting things. And we don't even know uh, what else to do. This, I, I like this slide also a lot. This is from uh, my, one of my PhD students at Bilkent in Turkey. Uh, uh, did this slide. This, he's, I think it's one of his best slides. It shows that we are more similar than we really think we are in general, right? <laughs> you can see the percentage over there. And we're, amazingly, we're so similar to a banana also. So anyway, <laughs> so there are many, many other questions. So uh, this is another example, given a bunch of short sequences, can you identify the approximate species cluster for unknown organisms? You can do a lot of scientific discovery. And in the end, basically, we're bottlenecked by this read mapping step. We know how to do this well. We don't know how to process this really well. And this processing also becomes more complicated as we want more information out of that processing, actually. I'll give you a couple of examples very quickly. So the real problem in the end is we want to construct the entire genome from many reads. Reads are fragments, segments that the choppers chop the genome into. So let's talk about this problem a little bit, and then I'm going to give you what we've done based on my experience, uh, where we are at this point. So this is called the read mapping problem. Basically, you have many short DNA fragments that the chopper gives you, and you want to uh, one way of reconstructing uh, 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 these read fragments into a full genome is uh, map them to a reference genome that you know of, with some differences allowed. So if I want to find out my genome, for example, there's a human genome that somebody constructed. My genome is chopped into pieces and you map them to the human genome and you want to figure out, uh, you guess how my genome looks like. So uh, pictorial, this looks like this. This is DNA logically. Physically, it's a mess. That's why we need to chop it actually into pieces that look like this. And then now you have the reads. Now you have some reference genome that you try to match the reads for. So this, this piece matches this one, but it doesn't match perfectly because no, no two DNAs actually match perfectly if, if they're from different people. Uh, so you want to really allow some differences over here. And those differences are actually really, really important because those differences are the causes of potential indicators of disease, for example, or potential differences in terms of the reaction to a drug. So you really want to find those differences. Uh, as well as similarities, of course, but similarity finding is a bit easier. Difference finding becomes much harder as the number of differences increases, as we will see. So basically, this is what we want to do. But this is a very computationally intense problem for multiple reasons. Uh, so uh, one way of doing this is actually taking each piece over here uh, and going through the entire reference genome that you know of and comparing each part. You, you basically take 300 base pairs, compare to 300 here, move it by one, compare to 300 there, move it by one, compare to 300 there. This is very computationally intensive. And actually some read mappers work that way, the BLAST mapper for example, uh, but uh, they, they, they're not very effective because they don't find uh, all cases where this maps uh, with a lot of differences. So this is called edit distance computation. 
basically edit distance is the minimum number of edits that are needed to make the read a fragment to exactly match the reference segment. I'll give you an example uh, from Netherlands and Switzerland. Let's, let's assume that Switzerland is the reference genome segment. Netherlands is the read that you've gotten. And you want to uh, see if Netherlands matches Switzerland. If you are looking for a perfect match, you're not going to get that, right? It's not a perfect match, clearly. Netherlands doesn't match Switzerland. But if you allow edits, at, uh, at least five edits, then these match it. You can see that uh, the, in these two uh, initial uh, letters, they mismatch. In this one, there is a deletion uh, in Netherlands and an insertion in Switzerland. The T matches. In this one, there's a mismatch, and all of these match. And then there's, another, uh, there's an insertion in Netherlands uh, that doesn't exist in Switzerland. So if you allow one, two, three, four, five edits, these match. And this is exactly what we want to do uh, in a genome sequence analysis. We want to allow some number of edits because there are some differences that we have. And the goal is to really increase the number of edits that we allow. So if your threshold was actually two differences, then these wouldn't match. If your threshold is 10 differences, clearly these match. And the goal is to increase the number of edits. But so of course this is difficult. There are a lot of algorithms that are developed for it. Most of them are based on dynamic programming. And so they form a dynamic programming metric matrix and they do a lot of backtracking on it. So this, this is, that's why this is very complex actually. We want to get rid of these as much as possible, uh, these comparisons. So for example, if you have a reference genome part uh, uh, that's, uh, that completely doesn't match Netherlands for some reason, you don't want to do this comparison. You want to quickly figure out that this Netherlands is not going to match this part in the reference genome and don't want to do that comparison. That's going to be the basis of the ideas that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about challenge a little bit more. Basically, you want to find many mappings of each read. Netherlands may occur in many, many places or uh, in, in a reference genome. How do you find all of them efficiently? You need to tolerate small variances and errors. Each individual is different, as we discussed. And by the way, you want to really identify what's a mismatch, what's an insertion, what's a deletion, because these have different biological meanings as well. These are not, uh, you really want to know what the, what, what the, what, if this is an insertion or a deletion. They're not, they, they not only have different biological meanings, they also are sometimes biased by the technology that you use for sequencing. So you really want to understand what kind of uh, things, differences that you're getting. So how can you efficiently map each read with up to E errors present? And ideally you want to increase E. As you increase E, the problem becomes more computationally complex. Uh, you can read some of the papers that I will reference. And clearly you want to do this very fast if you want to enable this uh, to be real time. So I'm going to give you uh, my story on this without going into a lot of detail because this talk is, uh, this lecture is about memory systems, not about bioinformatics. If it were bioinformatics, I would go into a lot of detail on all of these. But if you're interested, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, this is a really fascinating area. So when we first started doing this, uh, our goal uh, in 2007 or so, uh, we wanted to design a mapper uh, that's guaranteed to find all mappings. So you have a Netherlands and you want to find all of the occurrences matches of Netherlands in the reference genome with some differences allowed, E. And we wanted to increase E as much as possible. So at the time, the mappers were not very, this is called sensitivity, the mappers were not very sensitive. Blast, for example, if you increase E, it really uh, doesn't work very well. So we wanted to have a mapper that increases E as much as possible so that you can actually uh, figure out more matches as much as possible. And then somebody may make sense out of them, the, biologic, uh, the biologist, for example. And this is the mapper that we designed. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but we worked with the University of Washington Genome Sciences Department to validate it, in tr uh, by, uh, to show that uh, it's actually useful to find some variations that people couldn't find before. It was published in 2009, and you can find the source code and download it. So this is great. Uh, it's very nice to develop these mappers also. The downside is uh, all of these mappers are bottlenecked by the same thing, that, which I showed you earlier. Uh, it's called the edit distance computation. Basically those comparisons, those approximate string comparisons that you need to do because of edit distance computation. Now how do you go and tackle this problem? One way of going and tackling this problem is to accelerate this part, right? Uh, maybe you put it on FPGA so that uh, um, uh, the edit distance computation becomes faster. And there are a lot of works in that area. I think those are all good works. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. But another way of solving this problem is actually asking the question, do you really need to do all of these comparisons in a reference genome? And that was our idea, basically. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because this motivates the problem again. So our idea was uh, to not do those comparisons as much as possible. Basically, before we do the comparisons, we ask the question, should I really compare this fragment to this part of the genome? And you design a software filter that quickly answers the question yes or no. And if the answer is no, then you eliminate a lot of 
computation, useless computation. And hopefully you design the filter such that uh, whenever it says no, it's correct. Whenever it says yes, it may or may not be correct, meaning that the filter is not perfect. Uh, it may say it's going to match, you should do the comparison. And then when you do the comparison, you may find out that it's not going to match, which is fine, that's, uh, because that's exactly what you want to uh, find out when you do the comparison. So basically, the, the idea is a two-level two mapper. The first level is a filter. The second level is really verifying uh, whether uh, th these things match. So that's the idea, basically. I've given you the idea of the remaining uh, journey, if you will. And this is the first mapper that we designed uh, to accelerate what we designed earlier. Uh, and the idea over here is to actually uh, have, a, have a quick software database where, which you can query. And the query uh, does essentially what I said uh, by taking advantage of the uh, structure of the genome. So you build an index of the genome, and you, have, you know the structure of the genome. And you know that if you get this uh, a fragment over here is definitely not going to match the other parts. So how do you do that? You should really read the paper. The details are over there. But you can once you know have an index of the genome, you can do that sort of um, uh, optimizations. And you can actually download and use this. This is one of the fastest mappers of its kind. And it, basically, we showed that you can get rid of uh, uh, more than 99% of those edit distance comparisons. And as a result, you can speed up the mapper by more than 20x. So that's good. And then later we actually figured out, okay, if you have a filter like this, you can, uh, you can, you can do a lot of tricks in the sense that you can introduce metrics to do this computation really nicely, to do this filtering really nicely. I like this one. I'm not going to go into the detail, as I mentioned also. But uh, this uh, introduced a new metric that tweaks the Hamming distance so that you can do this comparison really, really fast with very fast bitwise operations that you can accelerate in a SIMD or a GPU, actually, engine. And this speeds up the mapper by another 3x. Uh, now we're actually building on speed, speed ups. You can see that this was uh, also open source. So you can actually download all of these and test for yourself. And then later, we figured out that you can actually map this filter nicely to an FPGA. And we built the first FPGA-based alignment filter that speeds up the mapper by another 10x. And it was published in 2017. Uh, you can also actually download the code over there. And then we actually did a lot of other studies related to FPGAs, how to trade off between accuracy and performance. Uh, accu uh, accuracy and performance, yes, speed up. You can read those papers. And this is our newest work. It's another algorithmic work. It designs the algorithm in a different way so that it speeds up the mapper by another 10x, actually. So it's really about how you design the algorithm together with the architecture to uh, give speed ups. And again, I, I'm covering all of these quickly. It's not meant to, you're not meant to understand all of these, so uh, you, can, you can read the papers. So why, why am I telling you all of this story? Basically, all of these explorations, whenever you optimize a software, in the end it becomes, uh, the, 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 the problem becomes heavily bottlenecked by data movement. We saw this in the FPGA, for example, the gatekeeper that I mentioned briefly, its performance is limited by DRAM bandwidth. That's true for even the uh, SIMD instructions, the shifted Hamming distance work that I mentioned. So uh, a solution, a good solution going forward, in my opinion, is to uh, process data inside the memory or close to the memory so that you don't have this bottleneck. However, of course, whenever you uh, change the paradigm so that you're processing data somewhere else than the processor, you need to design the mapping and filtering algorithms to fit processing in memory. And we're going to talk a lot about processing in memory during this lecture or processing near data uh, generally. Uh, but one example, actually, this is one work that we've done last year that shows that you can ma speed up the mapper significantly and make it more efficient if you actually shift it to the memory site. But there's a lot more work to be done in this area, in my opinion. So very quickly, uh, recap there. We, we basically exploited two key principles to accelerate genome analysis. We exploit the structure of the genome to minimize computation at the software as well as hardware levels. And we morphed and exploit the structure of the underlying hardware to maximize performance and efficiency. Essentially, this is really algorithm architecture co-design for DNA read mapping. And in the end, speed ups are reasonably large. Uh, we did a lot of rigorous studies on real data sets, so it's about 300x or so, sometimes more depending on the data set. Uh, and we also improve accuracy, but I'm not talking about that. You can, you can read the papers for the accuracy improvement. Some of the metrics actually improve your accuracy uh, nicely. But I'm even more excited about this because of devices that look like this. Uh, these devices exist today, and these can generate a lot of data very, very fast. 
And if you're interested in this, uh, we've recently written this paper. This was already last year, actually. We keep saying recently, but the last year. Uh, this talks about uh, how, how these devices operate. So these are actually very fascinating. Nanopore, essentially, uh, you pass DNA through a nanoscale hole. And while it passes through this nanoscale hole, uh, uh, it causes current perturbations. And you measure the current while the DNA passes. And each of these different bases, A, C, T, G, lead to different perturbations in current. That's how you identify in these devices. Now it's not perfect because you get errors. Sometimes you think it's an A, but it's really a C. So basically you get these current measurements and you feed it into a pipeline. And this pipeline, the first step is base calling. Base calling is whether this current is an A, C, T, or G. And these actually operate using a lot of neural networks as you can see today. These uh, deep nano is a deep neural network that's trained to actually identify these. And then you get these ACTGs, you do other stuff like a lot of graph processing on them to actually minimize the overlaps. And then you assemble a genome, a draft assembly. I'm not going to talk about these in detail. And then you do the read mapping that I just discussed. We actually accelerated this portion, but the genome analysis pipeline is much longer as you can see if you really want to uh, go from the current measurements all the way into a genome that you really want to uh, understand. So there are a lot of bottlenecks across all of these. Actually, in nanopore sequencing, this, this, this turns out to be a very tough problem today. How do you do the base calling very, very accurately? I think we need a lot of algorithms to this. You can see that this is neural networks, graph processing, some sort of approximate string matching, more forms of approximate string matching and graph processing, uh, and other kinds of algorithms. This, these also have some neural networks, actually. So the, these are actually really, really interesting applications that people are trying to accelerate all over the place, combined together in a single pipeline. That's, that's, what, that's one of the reasons why it's really fascinating also. Okay, so let's uh, pull back a little bit. So I'm give, I, I've given you all of this information, but where are we today? So this was our goal in 2007. We wanted an embedded device that can perform genome analysis within a minute. We're not there yet. Basically, there's, there's a long ways to go, I think. 300x is not enough. We really want 3 million x, maybe, to be able to get to, the, get to those uh, places. Uh, and, and on top of this, energy efficiency is a key problem. How do you make it energy efficient with this device? How do you make high performance? And we didn't even talk about security and privacy related issues over here, which is also very, very fascinating if you're interested in those areas. There's l less work in this area, clearly. Uh, uh, but it needs to be done. So the takeaway from, for, for me is there's a huge memory bottleneck. If you want future applications that uh, conform to our dreams, today we cannot do it because we're very much bottleneck by memory and storage. I, I think of memory and storage the same. Uh, they're, they're really about data storage and data processing. Because memory is a huge bottleneck, we cannot get there at this point. So we really need to rethink the system with memory. And I think this is an example application that can be enabled if we actually get rid of the memory bottleneck uh, as much as possible. So I'm going to stop about bioinformatics here. If you're interested, there's a video <laughs> of one of my talks. It's a bit old right now. It's uh, February 2019, as you can see. Uh, but you can find it online and uh, learn about it. Any questions? Okay. Am I talking too fast? No, I, I, I saw one, one face like this, but <laughs> okay. So now let's talk about the memory bottleneck because uh, I believe there are other applications like this that are waiting to be enabled and they're all bottleneck by memory. That's my belief based on all of these uh, results that I've seen and we've gathered over the years. And this is just one example. Now let's go into the memory. So uh, as I said, this first part of the lecture is going to motivate why memory is so important. Uh, we're going to see multiple perspectives, performance, energy, scaling, trends, and challenges. So we're going to talk a lot about main memory. Main memory is really a component that's between processors and storage, uh, and it's a critical component of all systems. Any system today has some sort of main memory. And this system must scale in many dimensions in terms of its capacity, technology, efficiency, cost, and the algorithms we use to manage it. If you want to actually increase the performance of your system and get the scaling benefits. Then it doesn't matter what kind of processing unit you attach to main memory. Processors, FPGAs, GPUs, a heterogeneous array of these different components plus accelerators, just like we do today. You're bottlenecked by main memory. You're bottlenecked by these connections over here. Also another picture that I... Uh, who, who uses XFIG here as a, as a drawing program? XFIG. Okay, I'm, I'm old, I guess. So oh, there's, there's one person. I like XFIG and I like drawing in it. And this is my XFIG picture that I drew, uh, drew, uh, drew in 2008, actually. It's still like this. Because no, nothing has changed in the processor design space, basically. It 
process still looked like this, kind of, at some level. Basically, take, uh, the, the key uh, observation that I'm going to make over here is if you look at a processor today, it consists of many cores and accelerators, those are all good. But everything else is really dedicated to data storage and movement. Caches, interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, other uh, memory controllers, other interconnects, memory, other interconnects, storage. Basically, most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data. If you do the calculations, more than 90% of a node is uh, consisting of components that just store and move data. We call these computing devices, but computing is really a small fraction of these devices. Computing is really done here. And even if you look at the cores, they have register files, interconnect, L1 caches, they're all storage and movement, right? It's, I think it's very fascinating. And the second is the memory system is a shared resource across these components. So you actually get into quality of service and interference problems when these different agents interact with uh, the memory. We're going to talk about that briefly, but that's not the uh, subject of this course, really. So let me tell you uh, some, uh, some broad uh, views of the main memory system today. Today, uh, there are some technology, architecture, and application trends that lead to some new requirements from the system and that exacerbate some old requirements. We demand a lot from the system. We're demanding a lot more going into the future. Uh, and I will hopefully show you uh, during the course of uh, these lectures that DRAM, the main technology we is, uh, design memory with, and memory controllers are unlikely to satisfy these requirements. They're actually already falling short, especially in terms of reliability, but also energy efficiency and performance. And on top of this, there are some emerging memory technologies uh, that enable some new opportunities. These are some emerging non-volatile memory technologies like phase change memory. Intel's 3DX point is an example of that. Uh, uh, they enable uh, some sc better scaling and other opportunities. I think this is very important, but I'm not going to sp spend a lot of time on this one because we, don't, we just don't have time, uh, enough time in this course. But this is also fascinating. And they could also satisfy some of these requirements better. So given these trends, I believe we need to rethink the entire main memory system and the systems we're designing around it. Uh, because we're really designing systems around the main memory system today. As a result, we have 90% of the system uh, dedicated to memory, right? To fix the issues we're having with DRAM and to enable some of these emerging technologies while satisfying all of the requirements. So this is in one slide a summary. Now let's go into a little bit more detail. So what are these trends that are affecting main memory today? So there are three major trends, I think. Performance, energy, and scaling. So performance, of course, a complex thing, right? It's, uh, we want more capacity, more bandwidth, more quality of service, predictability, and better latency from memory. All of those constitute performance in the end. Uh, let's go into this a little bit more. Uh, why, why do we want this? Oh, okay. There's a bit flip that happened maybe in memory, right? <laughs> that also happens. Uh, okay. That HDMI wants to stay there for some reason. It's gone now. Basically, uh, I think uh, there, there are three reasons. One is computation is not a huge problem today. We know how to put many, many agents on a chip. Moore's law has been good to us, and we've also optimized accelerators really well. So we actually know how to design these accelerators and cores and compute units really well. We can always do better, but we're at a very good point that we're, we were not limited by them. Applications are increasingly data intensive. I've given you one example from bioinformatics. I'll give you more examples. And we have an increasing demand and hunger for data, and that's not going to change. And on top of that, we want to consolidate more and more. We want to put multiple workloads on a single system so that we can make things much more efficient. And all of these are driving the capacity, bandwidth, latency, and quality of service predictability requirements up and up and up. And none of these are going to stop, actually. These are trends that are uh, so fundamental at this point. I'll give you a couple of examples. This is one example from an ISCA 2009 paper by HP Labs and University of Michigan. These folks uh, basically drew this graph where they showed that core count is doubling approximately every two years and DRAM DIMM capacity is not doubling as fast. Which means that there's a gap and this is called the memory capacity gap and the memory capacity per core is expected to drop by 30% every two years assuming you believe these trends are continuing. And they're continuing in some cases but not in all cases. Uh, basically the, the bad, there's a bad news here. The software has always relied on having more memory capacity so that they can add more features, they can add more, uh, I don't know, they can waste memory better also, there's also memory waste we have. But basically, uh, software is not as easy as before. Right? That's, uh, that's, that's one takeaway. Uh, and the also, also, whenever you see a graph like this, it's always good to ask the question, is this trend continuing or not continuing? You can do the study on your own. These are all public data that you can gather. In GPUs, actually, the trend is much worse. In GPUs, we're able to put many, many cores, but we're not able to supply enough capacity. In CPUs, the trend may have slowed down depending on which vendor you're looking at. Maybe we, we're not putting more cores, 
But then the question, a good question is to ask, uh, to ask is, why are we not increasing cores? There's a lot of transistors on a chip. And we, in, in fact, recently, um, um, one company, Cerebras Technologies, introduced the first trillion transistor chip, right? More than trillion transistors. Because they, put a wa they took a wafer and they used the entire wafer uh, to, 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 to build the chip. So it's more than one trillion transistors. Clearly, we can put more cores and that's exactly what those guys did. Uh, if people are not putting more cores, there's a reason, because the cores are bottlenecked by memory. <laughs> What's the point of putting more cores if you're bottlenecked by memory already? So these two trends interact with each other also. So it's fascinating, I think. Uh, basically, today we're bottlenecked by memory capacity, but not, also, not only memory capacity, but also memory bandwidth. Uh, if you plot the trends for memory bandwidth, memory bandwidth is increasing by 10% every year. Ignore the 3D stack technologies, we're going to talk about them. Uh, so it's not, inc it's not increasing as fast as capacity, as I will show you in the next slide also. Basically, uh, the takeaway, I think, is we know how to design these cores really well, make them very efficient, uh, but we don't know how to supply memory to them. Basically, we're starving them. As a result, we have a very imbalanced system. Okay, so this is one example. Let's take a look at another example from the DRAM chip perspective. Uh, this is always a fun graph to look at. Basically, uh, here I plot the last 18 years from 1999 to 2017, and I plot how much a DRAM chip, a single DRAM chip's capacity has improved Bandwidth has improved and latency has improved. And I already said capacity, we, can, we, we have more capacity than bandwidth. Uh, and actually capacity has improved. I normally ask the question, but we don't have a lot of time uh, today. So maybe I'll ask a question later. Uh, basically capacity has improved by 128x during those 18 years, which is a pretty good improvement. And you can see that the trend is exponential, nicely exponential over here. Uh, this is the trend from uh, the most common DDR chip. These are real data uh, of, of the field, most common DDR chip that you can find in the field. So the trend is exponential, but we're having difficulties. So even the capacity is not improving as fast at this point because we're hitting some scaling issues that we will talk about. Reliability is becoming a bigger problem with DRAM. As a result, manufacturers are not able to put more cells in a chip. Okay, let's take a look at bandwidth. Uh, I'll ask the question on latency, so get ready. Uh, well, bandwidth has improved about 20x uh, in, in, in DDR technology, again. Uh, as you can see, uh, bandwidth is a bit harder to improve than capacity. Capacity is the main focus uh, of improvement. Bandwidth is less of a focus, and bandwidth is also a bit harder in the sense that technology doesn't give you more cells when you, as you shrink the technology, more bandwidth as you shrink the technology, you get more cells. Here, you really need to scale the power, scale the number of pins, so that you can get more bandwidth. And if you pay more money, of course, you can increase the bandwidth even more, but it's not as easy as capacity. That's why you see this fundamental difference. What about latency? How much do you think latency has improved over the course of 18 years here? Anybody? 5x. 5x, that's a good guess. Very optimistic. <laughs> Which is good. I think it should have been 5x, but this is what we have. 30%. <laughs> so latency has reduced only 30% in commodity DRAM technologies, which is, I think, a big problem. That's why I think if we, uh, we, we do a lot of work on memory latency, I'll briefly talk about it, depending on how much time we have today. Uh, but we should be focusing a lot more on latency. Of course, there is a reason for it. Uh, because there's a fundamental trade-off between capacity and latency. As, as you want to improve capacity, put more, cram more cells, you want to have long bit lines, long interconnects, which are not good for latency. So this is the fundamental trade-off. As a result, manufacturers want to uh, favor capacity over latency. That's why we're in this space. There's another reason, I think. Uh, the other reason is we haven't really focused as much on latency today. Uh, people kind of ignored it, in my opinion. Because uh, the, the mindset is a processor-centric mindset, which we will talk about also. People always think, Maybe latency is okay. You design the processor to tolerate the latency. You design caches, prefetching mechanisms, heavy out of order execution, heavy, many uh, massive multi threading. So latency is okay. Maybe we can tolerate it in the processor. But as I will show you, that this is a bad idea going forward because this is really exacerbating the energy problem. And this also requires more bandwidth. This also requires more complexity in the system, as we will discuss. So that's, there are reasons why this latency has not improved. A lot of it is due to the mindset, the processor scientific mindset. But some of it is because there is a fundamental reason why latency and capacity are at odds with each other. OK, so this, I can talk more about this graph for, I guess, a day. But let's, let's, let's skip. So clearly, uh, performance uh, affects many applications. I've given you the bioinformatics side, but there are many applications that are already there, like this, uh, that are bottlenecked by performance. And again, 
uh, these applications are complicated. Some parts are bottlenecked by latency, some parts are bottlenecked by bandwidth, some parts are bottlenecked by capacity. So it's really a function of many of these things together. But clearly, they're, they're all bottlenecked by memory. You can actually read some of these papers that I mentioned over here. They, they are beautiful analyses of some of these applications. I'm going to talk about this paper later on um, in terms of where they spend the time. And this paper, for example, shows that Google's data center workloads most of the time is spent waiting for data, as we will discuss in a little bit. So if you look at the uh, mobile end, that's also true. Uh, basically, you have these applications, and they're all bottlenecked by memory, as I will show you in a little bit. OK, let me talk about this a little bit more. This is actually going to be a motivator for processing in memory also. Does anybody here know about the excites? OK, I guess I'm too old. <laughs> Does anybody uh, remember Alpha, Alpha processors, Alpha ISA? OK, some people do. That's good. So he was the chief architect of the Alpha processors in 1990s. And uh, he led design teams that designed the fastest processors of their time, competing with Intel at that time. And after uh, his team designed the Alpha 21 164 processor, uh, he basically wrote a one-page article in Microprocessor Report. You can read it. It's available on my website, but you can find it online also if you search for this. Uh, and in this report, uh, uh, what he said was, uh, basically, we designed this cutting-edge processor. It's able to finish four. It, it has a, ca a capability to finish four instructions every cycle, but it's finishing one instruction every 4.7 cycles in this very important workload. So it's operating at less than 1 18th of its peak bandwidth, which is really terrible. And he said that, why? Because it's waiting for memory. And then he finishes the article by saying this. I expect that, this is a quote, direct quote. I expect that over the coming decade, memory subsystem design will be the only emphasis important design issue for microprocessors. I don't know, only maybe it's too strong, but coming from a processor architect, this is actually very telling, I think. Okay, this is 1996, 1990s. Okay, let's fast forward to 2000s. I did my PhD thesis actually on memory latency tolerance. How do you design processors to tolerate memory latency better? We developed an idea called run ahead execution, which I may talk about if we have time later on when we talk about latency. What we did during the course of my PhD is analyzed uh, all of the workloads that Intel was using to design their processors at that time. This is a data from 2003, for example. And we found a very similar thing. Most of the time, the processor is waiting for cache misses to come back from memory. Okay, so this is another data point in 2000. So you don't believe me, you don't believe the sites. Since everybody believes Google, I'll present the data point from Google. By the way, this is my first paper from Renahead, but uh, this is Google saying in 2015, a beautiful paper in ISCA, uh, that essentially the same thing. They analyze all of their data center workloads according to what they say, and they basically do a lot of microarchitectural analysis, very beautiful analysis, and they say most of the time the processor is waiting for data to come back from memory. Actually, you can see that it's finishing instructions only 10 to 20% of its time. So basically, processor performance has improved a lot over the course of 20 years. I've given you the history of 20 years with three examples, but nothing has changed. The processors are still waiting for memory. And this is really because of the design choice that we make. We're processor-centric, and you, if you look at accelerators, that's very similar. We're accelerator-centric. We have to move the data from memory to the processor to operate on it. And if you're... Yes? What does it mean to be front-end bound? Yeah, I think front-end bound is actually there are some stalls in the front-end uh, like a rename stall, uh, like not enough register stall. Uh, there are a bunch of different reasons. You can take a look at that over there. But some of the front end stalls may also be caused by the back end front end interaction. That, but the paper has a lot of good analysis. Okay, so uh, there's more analysis that you can read in that paper. Okay, so that's about performance. Let's move to energy a little bit. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll go quickly. But feel free to ask questions like that. I think those are good uh, to uh, put in between. So clearly, energy is a big problem also. Uh, and uh, we know that it's a big problem. This is a data from IBM in 2003. Charles Lafergie and others published a very nice paper also uh, uh, describing, what frac uh, uh, describing the source of energy inefficiency in their big server systems, big iron systems in 2000 or so. And they found out that more than 40% of the entire system energy in the big iron systems is spent on the off-chip memory hierarchy. And at that time, off-chip memory hierarchy had DRAM, off-chip caches, off-chip interconnect, dot, dot, dot. Okay, similar folks, a subset of these folks, uh, ten, about 10 years later, let's say, uh, they published a paper analyzing the power consumption in IBM Power 8. This is the cutting-edge processor 10 years later. And they basically say more than 40% of the entire system power is in DRAM, in memory. Because DRAM remained off-chip, and its energy efficiency has not improved. Now it's consuming bigger and bigger fraction of the system power. 
Now that's true for GPUs also. Uh, there are other papers that actually are referenced over here, uh, which you can read. So basically, memory power is an increasing uh, design concern. It's going to be the major power consumer in the system. And one of the issues with DRAM is it consumes power even when it's not used. You need to periodically refresh DRAM. This is actually a very fascinating research problem also. How do you get rid of these refreshes as much as possible with hardware techniques as well as software techniques with cooperative techniques? I may get to talk about them later on. Uh, but this is really important because this refresh rate actually affects DRAM scaling as well as we will discuss uh, later. But let me give you one example of the consequence of mem main memory energy and power. So this is a uh, slides I borrowed from Bill Daly's presentation at High Peak in 2015. Basically, uh, these are all data values, so you can argue with all of these, but uh, the, the trends remain the same. He shows that a 64-bit double precision floating point operation is 20 picojoules in terms of energy. A single DRAM read or write is 16 nanojoules. That's like 800x, and I exaggerated, it, make it, making it 1000x over here. That's three orders of magnitude difference. So it's good to think about, does it make sense to move the data from the DRAM to uh, the CPU to do a single floating point operation, especially if you don't have good locality. And people have actually shown that if you really want to overcome this energy bottleneck, you need to reuse the data at least 200 times, depending on what, uh, what the equations look like, of course. You can do those calculations yourself also if you know the values. I've seen numbers as, as, as large as 1,600 times, uh, actually. Uh, Wen Mei Hu has some very interesting numbers related to that. Okay, we've done some study on these real workloads uh, with, with Google, uh, on the workloads that I showed you earlier, Chrome browser, TensorFlow, and video playback and capture. And we found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on data movement in these workloads. So you're really data movement bottleneck in terms of energy also. So we're going to talk about this uh, later on again. So that's the energy perspective. Energy is a growing concern, and it's really, um, it's really memory that's consuming most of the energy in a system today. Okay, the third big concern is actually uh, even more scary when you think about it in the context of this. On top of all of this, uh, even though we want better performance, better energy, uh, whatever gives us better performance and better energy is ending. It, it, this is DRAM technology scaling, and DRAM technology scaling is very similar to other technology scaling. You reduce the size of the circuit, you get better performance, better efficiency, better performance in the sense that you get higher capacity, more density, you get lower cost, you get lower energy. And this has clearly enabled huge improvements in systems today. And ITRS, International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductors, has been saying for a while that the future size of a DRAM cell will not easily scale below some level, X nanometer. And they, they keep changing their projections, that's why I don't want to change my slide, so this, is, this remains as X. But clearly, uh, we will see, and clearly as you reduce the size of a future cell, you get a lot of benefit. The downside is, it's becoming much more difficult to do so at this point, because of a lot of issues like reliability, as we will discuss. I'll give you real evidence from the field. Um, it's fascinating, but it's also not uh, a bit scary uh, from a security perspective. So let's go into this a little bit more. Basically. What is the scaling problem? Uh, I mean, we're looking at DRAM here, but any kind of memory technology requires two things to operate correctly. One is the storage device, the other is the access device. Uh, in DRAM, the storage device is a capacitor. You store charge uh, in the capacitor, and that charge indicates one or zero. It's charge-based memory. And this capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing. Uh, if it becomes smaller, it becomes vulnerable to different types of circuit noise. And it, we will see some types of circuit noise later on. It, it gets closer to the other cells, other cells start affecting these cells. Uh, if it becomes smaller, it's, uh, it also has less charge, meaning that uh, it needs to be refreshed more often because less charge gets lost more easily. Uh, on the other hand, the access device needs to be reliable also. In DRAM, the access device is the access transistor, the bit line, and the sense amplifier. Uh, and this access transistor should be large enough for low leakage and high retention time. And as this becomes smaller, you get high leakage uh, as well as low retention time. And so you need to refresh it more often. Plus, there are other issues. As this becomes smaller, you get some, res uh, some different types of resistance over here, and the latencies may also increase, as we will see in a, a paper. Basically, this was the value that was assigned to X by ITRS in 2009. They said reducing the size of this cell below 35 nanometers is challenging. They didn't say it's impossible, they said it's challenging. Now, I'll ask another question. Uh, what is this future size of a DRAM cell today in a modern DRAM chip? Can anybody guess? I'll give you a hint, it's below 35 nanometers. <laughs> Anybody? You had a good guess, 5x. Maybe you're optimistic here also. <laughs> 22. 
22. That's actually very close, yes. Uh, in, in, out, uh, in the EM chips that are shipped, it's about 20. Uh, they don't tell exactly, but there are there chips that are in production that are around 18 also. So, but clearly it's below 35 nanometers, that's the key point. So clearly we were below, but this has come at a cost actually. Uh, basically reliability has become a big problem. And actually this is a problem not in uh, just DRAM, but also any kind of charge based memory, flash memory and DRAM also. We, if you have time we'll talk about flash memory. Flash memory is a fascinating story also, uh, but I, we don't have time right now. But basically reliable sensing becomes difficult as charge storage unit size reduces. As a result you get less and less reliability. So this is an example study that we did with Facebook. Uh, one of my students interned at Facebook and we worked together with them and we analyzed the memory errors at all of their servers worldwide see uh, over the course of one and a half years or so. And this is a correlational study. Basically some servers have one gigabit DRAM, uh, some servers have denser DRAM, some servers have even denser DRAM chips. Now you can uh, correlate uh, the density of the DRAM chip with the error rates that you see on the servers and you can see this sort of correlation. Basically as the density of the chip increases, the error rate increases. And this is intuitive, uh, as chips become denser, the cells are more vulnerable to noise, as a result you're getting more errors. And if you really want to uh, look at more data, this, uh, we published this paper and you can look at more data over here. I think it's very fascinating. Uh, the, I, I like the sort of very large scale studies, if you can do them, these are very, very interesting. The downside of these large scale studies are they're by nature correlational, because you're not changing the system, right? Facebook doesn't want anyone to mess up with their system that's running in production servers. But it's, it's a lot of data. Uh, they don't allow us to tell how many, how much memory that we've tested, how many servers that we've tested. It's really a lot. Uh, maybe it's the biggest company. I don't know about that actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway. But of course, uh, you don't understand enough. That's why we've started building infrastructures that look more like this, small scale. Small scale meaning you have these FPGA uh, based memory testers. Uh, they can test memory. Uh, we, can, we actually have a programmable memory controller and they give you information about the kind of errors uh, depending on the test you do. We actually open source this infrastructure if you really want to do studies on real DRAM chips. You can download it from our website, uh, GitHub site. It actually has a nice C++ API. You can do any sort of test and we're happy to support it. We're working with many people and many people are actually publishing papers uh, using this infrastructure. Okay, that's the paper. So while we were doing these studies, I'm going to talk about this in even more detail, but uh, we actually found out that you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips uh, that are out in the field today. Uh, this is fascinating. This should not happen. You, sh you should not be able to predictably induce errors. Right? Some random errors clearly happen in DRAM, but predictably inducing errors is bad. This is called the DRAM row hammer problem. It's essentially a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And people are writing uh, articles that sound like this. Forget software, people are, uh, hackers are exploiting physics. I'd recommend this article also. It's very non-technical, but it gives you the basic I idea. So we're going to talk about this in the next part of this lecture. Uh, what is this row hammer problem? This is essentially a scaling problem in DRAM. You get these predictable errors. Okay, let me uh, leave row hammer for the next part of the lecture. But basically, uh, DRAM scaling has already become increasingly difficult. It's not just row hammer, there are about other things that are going to happen also. So as a result, people are exploring these emerging te memory technologies, like 3D stack DRAM, reduced latency DRAM, low power DRAM, and a lot of non-volatile memories. This, this picture doesn't do justice to it, but uh, the takeaway in this slide is all of these technologies are good at some metrics, but they're also bad at some other metrics. So there is no single memory technology that's good at everything that we want. As a result, uh, we're putting technologies that are different like this. Basically, these are called hybrid memories. Uh, we have different technologies that are good at different things and bad at different things. And we put them together in a system uh, and we designed the hardware and the software to manage the data allocation and movement between these different technologies to achieve the goods as much as possible while avoiding the bads as much as possible. And this is, I think, very fascinating. There's a lot of interesting research to be done that is being done in this area. There's more that needs to be done. But one thing that, that is clear, I think, is if you have this sort of hybrid main memory, you want intelligent controllers. You want these controllers to really understand the characteristics of the data over here so that they can manage the data. Uh, you want controllers to be exposed to the software so that the software can enable the monitoring of data and placement of data. There are many, many other ideas over here that I'm not going to talk about. But this is one motivator for intelligent controllers uh, that I will put. I, I will motivate them in different ways going forward and then we'll talk about computation and memory. Okay, so let me give you another paper that talks about uh, intelligent controllers slightly. This is a paper 
that I like a lot because it's written by two companies that normally don't talk with each other, Samsung and Intel. And this is the only paper that I could find that is written by these two companies, <laughs> co-authored. Uh, and these folks actually uh, wrote this paper saying that DRM process scaling is becoming difficult, refresh is a big problem, we're not able to determine the retention times easily because they change randomly uh, because of manufacturing issues as we will discuss. Actually there are fundamental reasons why they change randomly and the write latencies are increasing. So since it's difficult to tolerate these issues uh, with just process scaling and devices, we should architect controllers that can overcome some of these issues. For example, they propose uh, um, uh, error correcting codes uh, here have inside the DRAM. They propose refresh issues which we will not going to discuss but it's basically the same conclusion that I uh, have just said. Main memory needs intelligent controllers to overcome some of these scaling issues. And I'll give you more examples of this. So since we're talking about trends in main memory, I'm going to switch gears now. Assuming everything else's memory is scalable and great, you still have a problem. And that problem is uh, because how we organize memory. So this main, you have this main memory, it's doing very well. Uh, but if you attach different types of cores and applications to access main memory at the same time, it's a shared medium. As a result, these agents and applications and cores interfere with each other. Meaning that you need to handle this problem. This is a very orthogonal issue to everything else we've talked about so far. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail in this course, but this is a fascinating and important problem also. Basically, if you don't control the interference between these different cores, you uh, cause many problems. Quality of service, performance, fairness, starvation. Then the key question is how do you actually control the interference, right? And this problem is becoming more difficult. That's why I think this is also a very open research area on the hardware software stack. Uh, why is it becoming difficult? We have a lot of heterogeneous agents over here. They're becoming even more heterogeneous. They're sharing at different levels of the memory hierarchy. And we have heterogeneous memories over here. They're becoming even more heterogeneous also. So memory controllers are kind of in the middle over here and they have to deal with the, this question basically. How do you allocate resources to these heterogeneous agents to mitigate interference and provide predictable performance? and provide high performance, provide fairness, and provide a configurable substrate so that, such that the software can actually orchestrate uh, different kind of goals in this system. That's why I think memory controllers are kind of the center of the world over here, because everything, actually if you look at over here, there's DRAM and there are all of these accelerators and all of them go through the memory controller in the end. And if this becomes a bigger bottleneck, then you need to do something about this. Okay, it's, uh, people are already doing a lot of uh, stuff over here actually, especially in industry, but there needs to be a lot more research over here. So one thing that's clear here again is you need intelligent controls to uh, handle uh, this sort of quality of service problems. Okay, so I think we're... Okay, good. Uh, I'm always slow. <laughs> But let me, uh, let me finish this part by talking a little bit more about how do we solve the problem uh, and then we're going to go into the row hammer. So I think there are uh, multiple directions to follow. These are actually broad uh, directions again. Uh, if you are thinking about doing research in this area, I think these broad directions are good to know. Very, first of all, fixing it is important. How, uh, we want to make memory and controls more intelligent and this requires more in new interfaces, new functions and new architectures. I call this a system memory co-design. You co-design the memory together with the system so that you overcome memory's problems. Even though memory is not scaling, the system is scaling in the end. That's the hope. The second direction is can we eliminate or minimize the problem? Can we replace some not so good technologies perhaps with different technologies? I think it's not easy but I think this is very important to follow also uh, because some new technologies like phase change memory, 3DX points or MRAM or RM or memristors or carbon nanotube memories, uh, they can enable system-wide rethinking of memory and storage. So you can actually uh, design a complete different system this way potentially. And the third one is actually also interesting which is embracing the problem. You recognize the fact that different memories have different pro uh, issues and you design heterogeneous memories, none of which are perfect. Some of them actually may have a lot of errors but you understand your data and map your data intelligently across them. So some critical data gets mapped to reliable memories, non-critical data get to, uh, gets mapped to non-unreliable memories. And this could lead to new models for data management and maybe use it. So I believe none of these are easy and there's no single solution and I think the solutions require software, hardware and device cooperation in the end. So basically we really need to think across the stack over here. So let's go through this very quickly. Again, basically the first solution direction is new memory architectures. It's more memory centric or data centric system design. 
What are the examples? There are many example issues which we're going to talk about also. Enable reliability at low cost, reducing energy, reducing latency, reducing ban uh, improving bandwidth, reducing waste. Actually, there's a lot of waste in memory. I mentioned the zeros, uh, not zeros, but I mentioned whenever you give people memory, they waste memory. That's actually true. If you actually look at memory uh, today, a lot of it is zeros. It's, uh, by, by doing just zero compression, you can re reclaim 30% of your memory, depending on the applications. But, uh, so we should be thinking about reducing waste also. And enabling competition close data is something that we will talk about a lot. And these are some of the papers that we're going to cover, that we've been working on for a while. The second solution direction, which we're not going to cover a lot, uh, I'll spend a little bit of time over here, is emerging memory technologies. So there are some emerging memory technologies that seem more scalable than the ARM, and we know that they're more scalable than the ARM. You can reduce the size of the cell and the current scale nicely. Uh, and also they're non-volatile, and, they're, and this, they're more scalable because they're resistive. They're not relying on charge. They're really relying on the uh, resistance as, uh, uh, to store the value. So one example is phase change memory. This is actually old technology that was developed in the 1960s. Uh, we knew about the storage devices nicely, storage devices improved, but recently people have developed access devices to access these very reliably and fast. Intel and IBM in particular developed these access devices that are reliable. Uh, and these memories uh, store data by changing the phase of material, and different phases of material have different amounts of resistance that are very distinct from each other. And now you can read the data by detecting the material's resistance. Uh, and these are actually old numbers over here. This is a slide from nine, uh, 2008 again. But this, uh, this is expected to scale to about 2 nanometers or even less right now. People are thinking it's going to scale to very small nanometers. And even as early as 2008, it was prototyped at 20 nanometers. It's a beautiful paper by uh, IBM Journal, and Research, uh, Journal of Research and Development. The researchers actually uh, analyzed the technology as early as 2008. And if you're interested, you can read that paper. It's also expected to be denser than DRM because you can store multiple bits per cell. You can chop up the resistance range into many, many pieces, and you can store, let's say, th uh, four bits per cell. But the problem is these emerging technologies, like phase change memory, have many shortcomings. For example, latencies increase, sometimes energy increases. Refresh is not a problem in, these, in many of these technologies. You don't need to refresh. That's a, one of the reasons why they're more scalable than DRAM also. But the, the, the downside there, latencies increase there. Endurance is a problem if you write enough times to the cell, the cell degrades and you cannot write or read uh, in the cell. So the key question uh, we need to ask is can we somehow enable these technologies to replace DRAM or augment DRAM or surpass DRAM? We can surpass DRAM also because some characteristics are much better than DRAM and also these are non-volatile, right? Which means that you can directly access persistent data. If you're, if you're, if you're, uh, today we go to the persistent storage device to store our data but if these are very fast, very quick, maybe these can be programmed uh, such that we manipulate persistent data using our programming languages, which I'm not going to talk about, but there are, there are papers that are written on this topic. So it's fascinating. In the end, uh, there, there are many interesting research questions. And I don't have time to cover this, but we've been working on this also. Uh, since this course is relatively short, we're not going to cover emerging memory technologies, sorry. <laughs> But, they, but the, the idea is like computation in memory actually is going to be applicable to emerging memory technologies also. And issues like row hammer, they also exist in emerging memory technologies. So what we're going to cover is so fundamental that it affects any technology in the end. But in the end, I think we're going to have this sort of technology uh, going forward. And this is already happening, hybrid memories. Uh, and okay. So let me give you an example of hybrid memory, a different way of thinking about this hybrid memory. Uh, from the embracing it direction. There are three directions, if, I, if you remember. Uh, the third direction was embracing unreliability. So if you, if you kind of understand your data well, you can understand its vulnerabilities. So for example, there might be some data in your application if you get bit errors. If you get an error, it's, the application crashes immediately. Your system crashes. So you can understand that data. There might be some other data that you don't care if you get bit errors in, right? If it, it's a pixel somewhere here in memory, maybe it's not that important. And there may be shades of gray in between. So if the programmer uh, understands this, or if the system somehow automatically figures this out, that's also an interesting research direction, you can identify your data as vulnerable and tolerant, and you can map them to different memory systems. One could be reliable, and one could be low cost. It's just one example we're imagining. And we actually imagine this paper, if you're interested in this, you can take a look at this paper in DSN 2014. There's a huge design space, of course, uh, and uh, reliable memory could be very much protected by ECC, well-tested, and non-reliable memory could be like this. Uh, 
Now, if you do this, you can actually gain a lot of benefits. One of the things that we did, I think this is just scratching the surface. These are small results in my opinion, but the, uh, this, this, this sort of idea can enable even bigger things. Uh, basically, what we found at that, at that time when we were studying this problem, we said that we want to get rid of error correcting codes in uh, data center systems because data center systems use these error correcting codes. And most of the time, we knew that they were really unnecessary. You get bit flips, but the, a lot of the system data can tolerate it. So we wanted to understand, can we do this in a systematic fashion? Uh, basically, and we found out that if you actually partition your data this way, identify your data as vulnerable and tolerant and map them to different type of memories, you can get rid of a lot of ECC error correcting codes in your system. And you can still be reliable. So this is one example. Uh, if if you're interested, I, I think there's a wealth of exploration that could be done in this direction, heterogeneous reliability memories. And this is a paper that uh, talks about it. Okay, I think we already covered the uh, interference issue. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but if you're interested in the interference issue, it's really fascinating. Uh, any questions so far? When, when, when was our first uh, piece supposed to end? 45. Okay, we still have time. Okay, no questions, so I'll continue. Uh, so, uh, if you're interested in quality of service, uh, as I said, uh, I'm not going to cover it, but I have a lot of references over here uh, that I'm going to really rush through right now because we don't have time. If this were a longer course, I would actually cover quality of service and emerging memory technologies also, but we don't have time. I think DRAM controls are fascinating, so you can actually look at some of these. Uh, but I think, uh, okay, let me maybe, maybe pick, pick on one of these. So this one example, uh, this is my first PhD student, La Vanya. Uh, she, her thesis was on predictable performance. Uh, and uh, she developed these models where uh, you could uh, identify how much a program is being slowed down when it's running together with other programs accurately. This is a performance model. Of course, it's run online while the system is running. Uh, and uh, she showed that you could do this accurately by taking into account interference in the memory controllers as well as uh, the cache. This is the latest work that she finished with. So she showed that you could do this with, uh, within 10% error rate. Now, if you, if you can do this online, you can figure out how much a program is slowed down when it's running together with other programs. Now you can design the memory system or the entire system to uh, try to uh, achieve slowdown bounds, right? Basically, you can say this program should not be slowed down by my more than 2x. Now you know exactly how much each of these programs are slowed down by, and you can change the memory scheduling policy, memory mapping policy, caching policies, even core thread scheduling policies, so that you can try to achieve those slowdown bounds. And th these papers essentially do that. This is one of the examples I think that's really critical to do in quality of service. And of course, the difficulty here is this is, even though this is, uh, in my opinion, very good work, clearly she graduated, right? She got her PhD. <laughs> but there's uh, a lot more to do. Uh, so, how do you take into account different sorts of agents? You have GPUs, CPUs, hardware accelerators, all sorts of hardware accelerators. And all of them go through the memory controller. And ideally, you want to satisfy the guarantees, the uh, performance requirements of all of them. That's why I think this is a fascinating and a very rich research area. Uh, how do you do that with hardware techniques and software techniques together uh, is, is unknown at this point fully, especially when the system scales. Okay, so that's one thing that I wanted to point out. So that's why I think that in the future memory controllers are even more critical to research. They'll become even more important. And this is the picture that I showed you earlier. There are many goals, many constraints, and many metrics, and the systems are becoming more complex. So uh, one of the things that I, as I think also very fascinating, this is a paper that we published in, uh, about 11 years ago now in ISCA 2008. Uh, if you have this sort of complex system, uh, actually it's very hard for humans to design memory controllers. Uh, I designed a lot of memory controllers and I don't know how to design memory controllers still uh, in a very good way. In the, whenever you make decisions, like scheduling decisions, as humans you consider only a very small uh, number of state variables. But machines can consider many, many more state variables, and that's exactly what we wanted to do. Can we use machine learning techniques to learn the policies that are good over time? I think this is really important going into the future in all kinds of controllers that we design in our systems, because systems are becoming increasingly complex. Even if they're not complex, there are just too many variables that the humans need to deal with. Workloads are changing, systems are changing over time, and it's very hard to come up with a policy that's good under every possible condition. Uh, as a result, the policies humans come up with are very simple, but we showed that uh, if you actually treat the memory control as a reinforcement learning agent, and if you design the algorithms such that they learn the policies themselves, they can lead to much more robust and higher performance improvements in this case. I believe there is a huge potential in this case uh, in using machine learning to design memory controllers. 
So there are many new problems, and I think the main memory really needs intelligent controls. And one part of the intelligence comes from using machine learning, as well as I showed you over here. Okay, now let me give you an overview. I don't know how much time we have total in these lectures, but uh, recently I gave these lectures at different places. Uh, actually, one of the earlier places was in uh, a case of summer school uh, in Fuji last year. Uh, but basically, I intend to cover these stuff. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to cover all of them. So we'll, we're, we've done, we're done with this one. We're going to talk about Draw Hammer, and then we're going to talk about in-memory computation. I'm not sure how much time we will have about low latency memory, but it's really critical. Uh, and we'll see how much time we have on data-driven and data-aware architecture. It's a short part. And I'll, 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 I'll try to cover the guiding principles and conclusion, because I think those are kind of important. Does it sound like a good plan? Okay. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to... Okay, maybe I'll talk about this very quickly. Basically, we'll cover many problems, and I think these are all important. These are really difficult research and engineering, important fundamental problems, but they're also very industry-relevant, actually. If you, if you go to anybody in industry and ask them what is the bottleneck that they have, they'll probably tell you memory. <laughs> Recently, I was at the Design Automation Conference, for example, and people were talking about how to build AI uh, machine learning accelerators, and everybody was talking about... <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> maybe you don't like the AI accelerators. Uh, but basically, uh, everybody, some people were actually giving real results from their chips, and they were. Uh, uh, one of the folks was uh, nice enough to give the, the disparity between the energy uh, consumption of a memory access versus a floating point multiply and accumulate, and they said they ha the disparity is 160x, and they cannot overcome it basically. <laughs> So these are actually very industrial relevant in the end. I think, I think these solutions can revolutionize the world because they can enable new applications that we haven't thought about. Okay, so hopefully this course will give you uh, some ideas uh, and basic skills to develop some of these ideas. Okay, one, one thing that I will probably I should have said earlier <laughs> is do not try to read everything on my slides. <laughs> I go through my slides very fast. Uh, especially in a course that's fast like this. It's better to follow me and follow what I say and get enough from the slides so that uh, uh, they make sense. But if you try to read everything on the slides, then you will lose me. <laughs> that's, you, know, you may have encountered this so far. I think it's uh, also, if you do the readings, you'll learn a lot more. And I think I, I provide a lot of material, pointers to the materials. These slides will be available. I like this quote from, uh, I, I, I use this slide actually in my freshman course to motivate students how to listen to my lectures. But I like this uh, quote from Louis Pasteur uh, that says, chance favors a prepared mind. So the people, the people sometimes believe in luck, and I believe in luck also, but I also believe in the fact that uh, sometimes we, we, we don't get lucky because we're not prepared. There is something that happens, and if we were prepared, we would really understand in a different way. But because we, we weren't prepared, that thing happens, and we don't even realize that that happened, right? I think that's, that's what this means. Okay, so these are things that we are not going to cover. There's a lot more on memory systems, clearly. As I already said, we're not going to cover a bunch of these, but we're also not going to cover even more of the memory system, like cache management and interconnects. I actually believe interconnects are going to be even more important into the future. Today, they're in a weird state. Uh, at least in the large-scale interconnects, are people realize, uh, people are doing a lot of studies, but small-scale interconnects, there are fewer studies today for, for whatever reason, uh, but I think these are going to be even more important into the future, because in the end, uh, it's also good to think about the, uh, what is the problem, right? If, if you think about memory problem, memory is complex, but a good chunk of the problem comes from the interconnects in memory. Basically, we don't know how to interconnect things really well inside the memory. As a result, memory is becoming a bigger bond. Like if we had much better interconnects in the system, Memory, maybe memory would not be as big of a problem, like much more efficient interconnects, much faster interconnects. Okay, I think I've already given you this information, but there's my WhatsApp information also. Because the email is not scaling very well. I think it's hit the technology scaling problem. WhatsApp is scaling not badly so far, but it's going to hit the technology scaling problem also. So we'll need to come up with a better medium, like replacing human brains with some machines that can process all of this communication requirements, right? Okay, and you can feel free to contact me at any point in time. Okay, so we're going to switch to Rohammer, uh, but I, 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 I'll recommend this reading uh, that I wrote in 2013. So I was invited to give this talk in this International Memory Workshop, which is an industry workshop. It's an academic workshop, but a lot of industry attended. And they asked me to talk about memory scaling. Uh, and uh, I wrote this early position paper for that workshop and delivered a talk also. Uh, I, I still recommend this to my students because it's kind of early in the sense that it's 2013. I actually wrote it in 2012, but it's really 2013 is the final date. 
uh, it talks about these memory scaling problems. Uh, and I think there are a lot of challenges in memory scaling. We'll talk about the um, like refresh, latency, reliability and vulnerabilities, energy and power, and memory is inability to do more than store data. And we're going to talk about raw hammer uh, in the, right now, actually. But it's, it's also good to uh, think about the future. When we were talking about uh, in 2013, we said, okay, scaling is not good, not easy, and even Samsung and Intel hadn't wrote, uh, written their paper at that time. But now we're able to write papers that look like this. And I would recommend this paper also. We haven't started Rohammer yet, but I will recommend it right now. This is a paper that we've written five years after uh, the Rohammer paper. It was invited to this special issue on hardware se and embedded security. Basically, we covered all of the research that was done on Rohammer, just one particular aspect of scaling in the last five years or so. And there's a lot of interesting research, I think. You can see the circuit level, device level, architecture level, uh, security level, and system software level research. So we actually spent a lot of time to write this paper with my now PhD student. When he was doing the research, he was actually a bachelor student uh, with me at Carnegie Mellon. So that's what I will recommend. And with that, we'll uh, switch to Rollhammer.